Welcome to the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. This is our 151st episode on April 8, 2023. I'm the host of the show. My name is Andy Z, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. This is a show about the world and for a radically new world. And my name is Sansara Taylor. I'm the co host of the Revolution Nothing Less show. Here on this show, we stand for a basic truth that this system of capitalism imperialism that rules over us in this country needs to go. It needs to be swept from the earth at the soonest possible time and replaced with a radically different and far better system rooted in the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America. Now, a key part of the strategy of making this revolution, making it real, is to struggle with the ways that people are thinking and have been trained to think by this system that keep them locked to the system and going along with it to bring forward a revolutionary people and the organized forces to lead this revolution. So later in the show, we're going to share with you a substantial part of the question and answer period from a major talk that I gave a couple weeks ago at UCLA called Woke Lunacy versus Real Revolution. We're at the end of the show going to give you a way to get involved in this revolution through the fundraising campaign that we're in the middle of. But first, Andy has some things that he wants to say that he came in with, and then we're going to share with you a very inspiring section of the interview that Andy and I did with Bob Avakian, the revolutionary leader that we follow here at this show, who's forged a whole new synthesis of communism, a whole new framework of human emancipation. We'll share an excerpt of that interview with you as well. Well, I took a glance at the morning papers and print and online while fixing and drinking my coffee, and it was striking to me how routine, how normal, and even ordinary, the extraordinary outrages have become in these times. How too many people have adjusted to a situation where what would have sounded a huge alarm is now way past the snooze button, a situation where too many have adjusted to profound injustice, a situation where the newspapers and the internet move without blinking an eye seamlessly from the future-ending horrors to a better way to make tacos or barbecue or how to dress and party like a celebrity, a diet of diversion, distraction, and degradation to distort what you think about, keeping your focus on you doing you with an eye that no one gets the better of you. Brainwashing, yes, yes, brainwashing you to ignore, to accept, while New York City and the Northeast is enveloped in thick and poisonous smoke from massive forest fires. The summer polar ice cap is predicted to melt a decade earlier. And what is extremely ominous is the developments in the Ukraine war. This is a proxy inter-imperialist war between rivals who are squaring off like gangsters, fighting for world domination. This proxy war is dangerously spiraling to an all-out world war as the Ukraine is now taking the war into Russian territory with the U.S. providing arms and intelligence while just shrugging this off. And on top of this, the U.S. has admitted that they knew, read, they greenlighted the Ukrainians blowing up a Russian pipeline months ago. The U.S. directly benefits from this. The Nord Stream being blown up increases the flow of natural gas for decades to come to Europe as well. Germany, now I know probably why they were so good at securing supply deals uh, so quickly after the explosion. The media every day reports these incidents that escalate the danger of all-out imperialist war between the U.S. NATO war bloc and Russia. And it just seamlessly moves on by. Turn the page. It's accepted all as routine. It's all in a day's news. Just as normal as an article on succession. At the same time, fascist bum-rush school board meetings, attacking parents who defend trans students. Fascist parents are egged on by fascist politicians and Christian fundamentalist preachers. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. Getting teachers fired and disciplined for teaching history and basic science from Austin, Texas to California. Meanwhile, too many of the people who don't like this and who should be out in the streets and in the public square, who should be defending the people who are under attack, have been cowed and bamboozled into going along with all of this. All of this. But today's show, today's RNL show, is a doorway to change all of this. Today's RNL show is directed at everyone watching. We know that you know people like yourselves who do care, who are deeply concerned, 
who are troubled, who can't stand this world the way it is, who are sick and tired of so many people being treated as less than human, who agonize about our youth, who are tormented by the present and live in fear of the future they face, and they're harming themselves and taking their own lives in record numbers. This alone is symptom of a profoundly sick society. Today's RNL show is for everyone who despairs that the planet is burning, flooding, and heating with life literally impossible now for hundreds of millions who are fleeing their homelands. There is the real prospect of the Earth becoming uninhabitable for humanity. Today's RNL Revolution Nothing Less show is reaching out to you, and it is teaching you how to go out to all those people who do care and turn them on to this show, to this revolution to the leader we have in Baba Vakin, to becoming supporters and sustainers of this movement for revolution, digging into and spreading and taking up the proclamation, we are the Revcoms. Watch today's show. Watch the BA interviews and learn how to struggle with people from Jump Street, bringing the sharp shit that calls out the reality we face and fights for people to support the revolution. We all need to struggle and to argue and to discuss this with everyone, to learn about this revolution and to no longer accept what is unacceptable. Sansara. So with that, Andy, um, I think that sets a tone and an invitation and a challenge to our viewers. We want to go straight to this excerpt of the interviews that we did with Baba Vakian. It's towards the end of the third interview, and I ask B.A. to speak to those who are catching the worst hell really at the bottom of this society. Let's watch. Well, you've led us right back to something we wanted to return to before wrapping up this interview, which is um, the tremendous potential that it's clear you see in those at the very bottom of society. Youth in particular at the base of society caught up catching the worst hell, the youth and others in the prisons which you said the brother on the block or on the street, people who right now their guns are pointed at each other to way too large a degree. Um, all of the vision of what you've described of what's possible to do with state power is not going to happen if we don't make a revolution. And yet this is a section of people who are very critical to the revolution we need. So I wanted to give you, and we wanted to give you one uh, further opportunity to, to speak directly to those who are catching the worst hell and treated as the worst of the worst. What is their role in this revolution and to those going out to them? How should we do this? Well, I say there, there's both a personal dimension to this and a larger scientific dimension to it. I know that things have gone on for generations now. I mean, I know some people told us, well, you can't, you can't bring forward these youth. They might have been revolutionary once back in the day of the Black, Black Panther Party or what, the 1960s. But there's been generation after generation caught up in this bad shit now, so there's no potential anymore. Yes, there is potential. And in, in, in one sense, it's exactly because they have been caught up in it generation after generation that there is potential. But you're not going to see it if you're just looking on the surface and what people are into. You have to go a little deeper with people. And I'll just introduce a personal dimension to this, which is very real for me. When I, when I see, you know, and whenever I get a chance to interact, and I do sometimes with some of these youth you're talking about, I see people that I knew when I was coming up. Not that I was, came out of the same place they did, but people that I knew, you know, and I, I know what their potential was. You know, I've talked about this before, I've written about it before. You know, I had a friend, Billy, who was, was, got into the life and got killed, you know, while he's still in his 20s, caught up in a lot of bad shit, and did bad shit, but also had a whole other side to him. Had a curious mind, a sharp mind, you know, had a lot of very good, you know, uh, sentiments toward people, ways of relating to people. And, you know, you, you could not ha have told me that somebody like that couldn't be transformed to become a revolutionary because I knew better. And that's just a personal, and I knew other people in the same situation. I was, I was very fortunate to know people in this situation, you know, 
people who open their hearts to me the same way I did with them, you know, that, that's what it means to be friends. And you, you learn what's deeper beneath the surface of what's going on and why people are into the bad shit they're in. And, you know, how constricted, how limited and confined their lives are and their choices are, you know, as, in terms of how things are presented to them. And, and so that's like, on the basis of that personal experience, I don't care that generations have gone, I mean, I care, but it doesn't tell me because generations have gone on that, that these aren't basically the same people. They are the same people, you know, and when I interact with them, whenever I get a chance, and it's far too rare, but it's very precious, I know they're the same people. So that's on, like on the personal level from personal experience, but more scientifically, you can analyze where do the actual interests of these youth lie? You know, look, I've spoken to this before. Look what it means when even for a brief time, people in this situation rise above this. And I mentioned this prisoner strike in Alabama, and people are talking about how they've overcome the divisions of gangs and cliques and this kind of thing. You know, it's not going to last because of the conditions they're in. But it's very significant and precious when it happens. Or, you know, I've made this point about the truce that followed, you know, the gang truces that followed the 1992, you know, L.A. rebellion, which really wasn't just L.A. rebellion. It spread around the country. And, you know, how hard people tried to overcome generations of divisions and back and forth revenge. You know, I mean, to me, one of the most inspiring and moving things I've seen in decades was the picture after the L.A. rebellion. You know, besides, you know, blacks and Mexicans tonight, together tonight with graffiti, you know, there is a picture of a blood and a crip with their arms around each other. And that wasn't just for show. That was something real and something deep. And they tried, they really tried to overcome this and they put forward a program, but their program was just a program that had no basis and it was also just actually mirroring this existing system. It was a program to establish more black businesses to enable some of these people caught up in the gangs to get into you know, the economy by way of business and so on. And there's no material, there's no economic basis for that on a broad scale. And it wouldn't lead to the liberation of people either because, you know, a few people might get into business, but then, you know, most people can't. And plus the ones who do are going to be employing other people and exploiting them, whether they mean to or not. You know, but still, look how, look how hard people tried. And there was a prisoner, you know, uh, uh, strike in California a number of years ago. The same kind of thing. Yeah, the gangs are still in there, and yeah, there's bad shit, but they, they rose up and overcome that for, overcame that for a short period of time, and that shows the potential, and it also shows that there's something deeper in people than what they're doing every day and what they're caught up in, that they, they you know, reach for something better, something higher. They, they want something different, you know, and if you, if you get people away from what they're caught up in, and talk to them heart to heart, they will, they will tell you in many cases, most people want something different, even if they're caught up in this and they don't know how to get out of it. And that's where we come in, the revolutionaries, the people who have come to understand that there's a whole different way. We have to go to the, these youth and others. Yes, we need to go to the educated youth. You're not going to make a revolution without people from the educated youth. That's very important for the revolution, including critical and creatively thinking people who have a capacity to you know, work and grapple with complicated ideas. We need that. But we, your question is very much to the point about you know, these more you know, youth down on the, uh, on the street, you know, the, the hardcore youth, you know, there is burning within them because nobody, look, nobody wants to live the way these youth are being forced to live. You could take all of, maybe a few, you know, really into it, you know, and this is really their thing, but nobody, if you're talking about, I shouldn't say nobody, but overwhelmingly, people don't want to live the way people we're talking about are forced to live. But this system, we could go into why and how, you know, it, it de-industrialized, you know, all these areas that people live in, you know, like the south side of Chicago. 
used to be these factories, a gigantic steel plant, U.S. Steel, that people used to work at. Gary, Indiana, which is now a ghost town, had the biggest steel plant in the entire world, I think, going back a few decades. And a lot of black people work there. Those places are closed down. These youth coming up, they have no future. And that's because of the workings of this system. And there is a burning down there. It may be simmering. It may be just a flickering flame, but there is a burning for something better. And it's up to us to provide the vehicle and the means for all these masses of people in this situation, including these youth, to become part of fighting for something better. And yes, it goes back to the previous thing. We're not going to do it without a lot of struggle. You got to break through the surface. You got to break through the bullshit. You got to break through even the hardcore shit to get down to where people really live and feel. And then you got to struggle with them about what your life should really be all about. What is really worth dedicating your, and if necessary, even giving your life to? Not that we take that lightly. We certainly don't. You know, we understand that, you know, as Mao said, of all things in the world, people are most precious. And people's lives are precious to us. But even if you have to give your life, give it for something worthwhile, something that's going to mean something for you and people like you all over the world and for the little ones. And don't tell me you don't love the little ones. I see you out there pushing the little ones around. I see the pride that you have in the little ones. So don't tell me you don't care because I know different and I know better. And there is a way, but we got to give people the way. And that means a tremendous amount of struggle. It's not a, just handing them away and they're going to take it. It's a tremendous amount of struggle. You know, and we have to also, especially in this rare time when revolution becomes more possible, we have to get right down on the ground with them and explain in terms they can understand and then get in more into the complexities as we go along. But get to the basic thing that there is a way out of all this. And right now we have more opportunity than, we, than we've had in your lifetime or my lifetime to do this. And we can't afford to be wasting this time and this opportunity in bullshit. We got to get with this revolution so we can get all this shit off of our backs and make a future for the next little kids you're pushing along that's worth living for. So they don't have to go through what you are going through now, which isn't what you wanted to go through, but it's what the system has put you in the place of to have to go through. We have to go and present this to them in a living way. There is a way out of this. It's not an easy way. It's not a guaranteed way, but it's a real way. It's a real possibility, especially in this time when we're talking about where the conditions are more favorable for revolution, even as they're tending right now towards something terrible. With the ruling class divided and fighting each other, with society being ripped apart, with the potential for this to rip apart all the dominant institutions in society. You know, one of these youths said, well, you know, if I get with your revolution, my chances of being taken out are just about 100%. But if I do what I'm doing, going up against people like me, maybe my chances are 50-50. Well, that's just wrong, like I've said before. You know, it's wrong in terms of what your life should be about, and it's wrong in terms of, you know, uh, the, the possibilities for revolution. Because we have a real strategy, and we have a real, you know, method to grapple with the problems that lie on the road to revolution and actually break through and gather more and more forces to where a revolutionary struggle for power could actually have a chance to win. And you can't ask for more than that. You can't ask for more than a chance to win to get this whole fucking thing off your back. And this is what we're aiming for, and this is what we got to take to people and explain to them and struggle like hell with them about what speaks to their deeper feelings and hopes and aspirations, not just the shit they're caught up in on the surface. So I say both from personal experience, which is limited, I know, but it tells me something, but also by scientific analysis and by learning from all different kinds of sources and, and getting every bit of knowledge I can, that there is a potential there and we have to go and make that potential become a reality and make the, struggle with people to become emancipators of humanity. And we start winning some, 
It's going to provide the basis to win more, and it's going to be, become a pole of attraction, and what people would really like to jump to will start getting expressed when they see a growing force out there that's real. And so this is my answer. We got to, you know, we have what these youth and the mass of people need, but it includes a lot of struggle with them, and we have to go and take that to them and wage that struggle because this is for ending all the shit that they're, that they're being forced to go through and all the shit that humanity is being put through and that they're threatened with now with the destruction of the environment and this danger of nuclear war among these imperialists, we have to go to the people and give them the means to do what deep down they would love to do if they could understand scientifically that there's a basis for it. So that's what I would say. You can't ask for more than that. That's a, you know, since our very important stand and point that he's making right there. You know, with all we've talked about at the beginning of the show, all that was brought forward before this in the interviews with the situation that we face, and if there's an actual chance, an actual chance to make a revolution, that's something you can't look away from. You really can't ask for more than that. Of course, people have questions. The people you're going to go out to are going to have questions. They're going to have, could we really win? What comes next? How do we do this? What about the history of communism? All these kinds of things. These are all real questions, and we have answers to, it, to them. And, you know, as I've said many times on the show, and we've gone into here, Bob Avakian, his most important breakthrough is in putting communism as a science on a thoroughly and consistently scientific foundation, which means there's a method and approach for you to analyze reality as it's actually developing and to discover the pathways to achieving these objectives. And he's done tremendous work on this. So we have answers, and we also have a way for you to do that. And if you watch the interviews, you're going to find all that. And the other thing that really struck me is he poses the question of what is your life going to be about? Now, he's addressing here very specifically those youth who are on the bottom of society who need to be the backbone of this revolution. But he's speaking to everyone here, and he actually says that. He's speaking to everyone, as I said at the beginning, and is in the beginning of the, the preamble to the uh, We Are the Revcoms proclamation, to everybody who cares about the future, who cares about humanity, who has the heart to fight for something better and different. Yeah, I'm like you. I'm so... Uh struck even having seen it before and being in the room when we did those interviews by how much heart and revolutionary determination and optimism that Bob Avakian conveys in, even in the face of all the horrors that are hurtling towards people in this world right now and everything that those on the bottom face and strategic confidence and nerve to struggle with people to rise to what they're capable of as makers of this revolution. So we wanted to, again, as you just mentioned, point to the proclamation, we are the Revcoms, which really concentrates uh, why we need this revolution and how we're going to go about, as it puts it, seizing on this rare time that Bob Avakian talked about, more possible to make a revolution now than at any time in his lifetime or ours or anybody's watching. A rare time when the rulers are fighting, when society is being split apart, and the chances of making this revolution are heightened we are determined to defeat this system and to bring forward the forces needed, the people, the revolutionary leadership and, and organization necessary to be able to lead millions to defeat the violent enforcers of this system, to abolish this system and its institutions, including its constitution, written by slave owners and exploiters that can only ever serve to perpetuate a system of exploitation, and to establish a radically new liberating society and system as set forth in the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America that Bob Avakian authored, and that he goes into in the interviews and brings alive. Um, so this We Are the Revcoms proclamation is a tool, it's an anchor, and it's a way to spread this revolution. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, first off, it was incredible to be able to do those interviews. 
And these interviews are incredible for you to actually get into. You know, um, these are three interviews, each about an hour and a half. And these are just a master class in method and approach in how to actually go out. You want to know how to struggle with people? Watch these interviews. You want to understand what's happening in the world? Watch these interviews. You want to know how we could actually make a revolution? Watch the interviews. You want to know what's coming next? What comes after that? What kind of society we're going to have? Watch the interviews. And as I said on the live stream, when you get a sense of the point you just made about the tremendous heart and soul, that gives you a sense of the character of the leadership of this revolution that's modeled and fought for all the way through our ranks and that you can be about too. So I just, if you're watching this show, part of supporting the revolution is going out this week to 10 people and seeing to it that they watch those interviews. Get it in front of them and then give them a shout in a few days and see if they've started them. And it's been our experience with those who've watched it. It's only uh, several thousand people at this point. It needs to be tens and hundreds of thousands of people and ultimately millions of people. If they haven't watched it, get into some struggle with them because there's nothing else like this. And it's actually could be what's a game changer in bringing people to this leadership, to this revolution, so that they themselves become emancipators of humanity. Woke is a destructive force in the political, intellectual, artistic, and ethical life of society. Bizarre and capricious rules enforced by cancel culture threats, puffed up unscientific claims to represent the marginalized, insisting that people stay in their lanes and fighting oppression. Woke lunacy manifests much that is harmful with the capitalist imperialist system and its dominant culture furthering the nightmare of humanity. Woke once meant righteous awareness of racial oppression, but has long since morphed into fanatical lunacy and vicious mob mentality, a bloodlust to target and tear into individuals, while cowardly ducking and often actively obstructing the real and needed fight against the system, especially its overthrow through an actual revolution. Woke lunacy and the fascist steamroller moving through society are in a deadly dance, mutually opposing while fueling and feeding off the other. Fascism is by far the greater danger. But in this dynamic, brazen white supremacy and misogyny feast on and defeat the brittle bravado of woke. At a time of unprecedented change, as the powers that be clash and as cohering norms of the U.S. are ripping, there is a much greater chance to bring this whole oppressive edifice down. We have a chance to aim for something radically different. We have a responsibility to fight for something actually liberating. We must seize this chance and rise to this responsibility. So out of love for humanity and the planet, out of profound respect for truth and science, and out of necessary revolutionary determination for the emancipation of all of humanity, we will defend and debate the following in the public square and in public discourse. So that's how this statement from the Revcoms begins, and it goes on to detail and just totally demolish the whole framework of woke identity politics in seven points and backs it up with a whole lot of substance. And this was released on Revcom.us in tandem with the speaking tour that Sansara Taylor's been on, Woke Lunacy versus Real Revolution. All right, so we've been featuring the speech that I gave at the uh, most significant event so far on the speaking tour at UCLA a couple of weeks ago. We've been featuring that speech and the Q&A that followed on this show in the recent episodes. And we want to bring you more of it today. Um, we're going to bring you more of the question and answer, which gives you a feel for what got opened up in the room when we took on this woke lunacy and we fought for and contrasted it with real revolution as it's been re-envisioned by Bob Avakian and brought to bear the tremendous analysis and exposure he has done of woke lunacy. And you see how it opened up thinking that needs to go and get opened up in a much bigger way in society. We'll talk more about our plans for this tour and your role in it after we share this portion of the Q&A. So let's watch. 
From my country, France, like woke has been a, a concept, a lexicon that has been constructed by, constructed by the conservatives to discredit like anti-racist, like or queer or anti-patriarchal uh, thought. And I wondered how can you construct and build a left-wing communist revolution if you use the lexicon and the words uh, that has been constructed by conservative people? And that's basically my question. Like, do you like do you, do you think those words are Like, who constructed those wor words in America, and how can revolution be thought with the words that are not constructed by Marxists, for instance? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by using a bunch of words that were not constructed by Marxists, like you use the microphone, we didn't make up that word, she's walking up the stairs, we didn't make up that word. Words describe, if they're, if they're useful, they describe something that's objectively real. And I start, and I think we all need to start, if we want to change the world, with reality. You can't start with who used the word, who made it up. Is woke a phenomenon? And we say in this big piece up here, woke is a destructive force in the ethical, moral, intellectual, cultural life of society. We say in this piece, woke in its roots came out of the black vernacular and mainly meant being aware of racial oppression but it has long since morphed into something that is very radically different. And when we talk about woke lunacy, we're talking about the people who stormed in here but don't have the courage to come and make an argument for their position. They just try to shut it down. We're talking about the canceling and erasing of murals. This is not something that's been invented by the fascists. It's being seized on by the fascists, and they are clumping all kinds of things that are legitimate cries for justice as also woke and, under, and deserving of attack. But because they use it and also misuse it does not mean it's not a real phenomenon. We have to start with reality. And if we don't do that, then we will never address what's really going on. Um, I mean, there's actually a lot of preoccupation with language and word changing and who made up a word and where does it, who sign what the word signifies. And we say also in here, the last thing I'll say on this is word changing An obsession over words is no substitution for world changing and looking at the actual reality. So woke is a real phenomenon. We have to name it because it's, being, it's doing something highly destructive in all the ways I described, and it's doing it in the name of the oppressed. And when fascists do destructive things, a lot of decent people go, oh, that's outrageous. But when people do this woke lunacy in the name of the marginalized or the oppressed, and they marshal their and commodify oppressed identity, they intimidate and silence decent people. And so it's really doing a destructive thing. It has to be named. It has to be called out. I, I appreciated um, everything you said against the woke ideology. Um, my first comment is I d still don't really see the connection between anti-wokeism and communism. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, uh, you are very correct in espousing an evidence-based approach to pretty much everything, especially policy. So what is the evidence that communism is a better form of government than what we currently have? Okay, those are two very good questions. Thank you. Um, the reason, okay, first on the relationship between woke and communism. Yeah, yeah, anti-woke, yeah, 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 okay, anti-wokeism and communism is woke right now today in this society among decent people, among people who actually do care about white supremacy, who oppose it, who don't care about it with a kind of a happy feeling, but care about it like they actually know this is a horror, who care about what's being done to women, who care about the planet, the health of the environment and the ecosystems, the people, the decent people. Wokeism is the dominant form of accommodation to this system. And it is the dominant form of intimidation of people from standing up against this system. And that's why we have to take it on. Because people as they are right now, the decent people really are caught up in, and, and it's, it's, in, it's like an infestation on the college campuses in hiding from reality. That's why I gave the examples of him taking this poster out And the students, instead of saying, let's stand up and fight to stop this, they said, get off our campus, you're upsetting me. You know, a few years back at Antioch, a man who made a film about Juanita Young, whose son Malcolm Ferguson was killed by police, went to Antioch College, showed this film, 
And this was before the big uprisings that people where this made it in everybody's public conscience. And it was the first time these students were hearing about this horrendous murder that's so systematic and systemic. And instead of getting into that and what needs to be done, instead they all debated the fact and decided that this white filmmaker had no right to make the film. And that's all they wanted to talk about. It's a form of avoiding the struggle. And avoiding the fact that it does take struggle, it does take risk, it does take getting out of your comfort zone. And it does take thinking scientifically. And the other thing that, about wokeism, and it flows out of the relativism, the postmodernism that is so um, almost universally taught and enforced, is there is a denial of objective reality. It is where I began, that objective reality is part of white supremacist culture, that it's a white European male construct, that it's a form of violence to say that we all have to be evidence-based in what we're saying. Let's just go with the experience and worship the experience of the oppressed. And it's intersectionality, centering the marginalized. Yes, people experience intersecting forms of oppression. That's true. Just like people with diseases might have intersecting diseases and symptoms. But that doesn't tell you anything about what's giving rise to it, what's beneath the surface. And the whole framework of postmodernism, intersectionality, and in its virulent form, wokeism, is anti-scientific. It is against looking beneath the surface. It is, and the wokeism is anti-rational because it shuts down discourse. Who are you to say that? You're not XYZ identity. It's like the guy who wrote the article saying, actually, James Webb wasn't a homophobe. Here's the evidence. I looked it up. It's a misquote. I found the evidence. It was from this other person. They, instead of going, oh, wow, we had the wrong guy, somebody wrote an article against him like three days later that said, the straights are here to save us, and said he had no right to speak about it because he wasn't gay. It's anti-rational. It's an so this is it's both anti-rational, anti-scientific, that's one, not both. It's both anti-scientific and it's anti-revolutionary because it's about fighting for your, a place within this system rather than looking at the roots of this oppression and the need to overthrow this system. So, which brings me to the second question you asked, very well placed. Um, what is the evidence that communism would be a better system? And it is because every society... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a brief answer, but I'm going to invite you to, to search for the answer. And it's serious and it's important that it, there is a search, because this is another thing that's been lied about, maligned, distorted. Not a surprise in a capitalist society that's threatened by this. Um, the, the fundamental problem in the world today, at the base of everything, is that, or the most defining thing about human societies is we have to reproduce the requirements of life. Food, clothing, shelter. New generations have to be reared. Every society, every human society, that's the most fundamental thing about it. We live today, and then culture grows up on that foundation. Belief systems, relations, ideas, moralities flow out of and reflect that. Today, we live in a capitalist, imperialist society where the fundamental contradiction of this world, for the first time in human history, is not that there's scarcity. There's enough to meet the needs of all of humanity, to, to feed, clothe, shelter, and to have a lively and enriched intellectual, cultural, and social life for everybody, too. The only reason it doesn't happen is that the massive means of production, the networks of, of production and transport and communication and technology, they are worked by millions, socially. Billions come together to work to produce all of these things. But what is produced is owned privately by capitalist imperialist, uh, by capitalists, enforced by a capitalist imperialist system and backed up by laws that are enforced by armies and police. So you have the abundance, but it's privately appropriated and that's enforced by a state. By overthrowing that state, by overthrowing that system, by implementing a radically different system, you can un unleash those same networks of production, those, that same productive capacity in a different way towards meeting people's social needs, not towards private appropriation. And you can do it by unleashing the most important resource of all, which is human beings who are thrown away and discarded in their creative capacities. And so socialism on the road to communism is a, is a system that is based on that socialized production for the social well-being of, of the society and the world. And then how you go about running that society and uprooting all the leftovers 
of this society, how it's trained people to think and act, uh, how you have new laws, how you have new culture, how you have new media, how you have new education, all that and more is spelled out in this Constitution. It's very lively, very, including a lot of encouragement for debate and critical evaluation because you need that challenge from every, every direction and everybody participating in that. So it's, it's a bigger answer to really answer it, you're right, you'd have to put your, but it's a, it's, I'm trying to give you a piece of it and invite you to read this Constitution and do hold it up against the U.S. Exploiters version, I mean the U.S. Exploiters Constitution. And also on the website, revcom.us right now, Bob Avakian just republished a piece that breaks down the U.S. Constitution and how it is not only written by slave owners, but always and can only protect relations of exploitation. It's a very profound piece. I would invite you to dig into that. Come to Laval tomorrow, talk more. It couldn't be a more important question. Hi. Uh, I'd like to start by saying I've agreed with a lot of the talk, and a lot of the points were very well placed. Um, but I do have some concerns as to pushing back too much on wokeness and losing some of the potential good. For example, like when it comes to the problem of identity, it's a problem that you, you pit uh, identity politics, generally, or wokeness, against the idea of an objective reality. And what I argue, maybe, is that an objective reality is something that is, is real, right, but is not necessarily easily accessible. And uh, upholding identity can be a useful heuristic towards voices that are necessarily less heard, could be better heard, in order to get to a better objective reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, and another thing is that uh, many people have argued that uh, this idea of stepping out of your safe space, and this is something I fundamentally agree with, that we need to be able to step out of our safe space, but also I think as a matter of strategy, there are those who are simply better able to step out of their safe space, and it is when their safe space is not as threatened as others, I think. So if we, I think there is something to be said about recognition that it, there is, it is, hard, it is harder for someone who is more oppressed to step out of their safe space, and I think that's something that can be overlooked in discussions about the excesses of wokeness, is that Space needs to be made for comrades who find it more difficult because of their situation mm -hmm. to step out and learn this reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to respond to what you're saying this way. Um, it is absolutely the case that there are people, oppressed people, whose voices and experiences have been erased, suppressed, distorted, lied about, and it is profoundly important that we hear those voices and learn from those experiences. That's why I gave the example, I mean in the speech, there's many that could be given of this woman in Harlem, and I said everybody should learn from that experience. It matters when the parents whose children have been killed by police speak about that and tell and expose that to the world. Everybody should hear those experiences and those voices. And the, and the institutional forces and the cultural forces that have suppressed the voices of the oppressed and the stories of the oppressed and the histories of the oppressed need to be fought against. So that part is very important. But where identity politics and wokeism goes wrong and why it needs to be fought is that it tells you you have to stop there. And that then all you can do is follow the experience of the oppressed. But just because you're oppressed does not mean you know where that oppression comes from what gave rise to it, how it should be ended, what it will take. Most people have no idea. That takes science for everyone. Now, oppressed people, just like anybody else, can take up the tools of science, but there's a struggle between communism and rationality and scientific thinking on the one hand and wokeism on the other, which is actually not just fails to look beneath the surface, but opposes that. And this is where it does great harm. And you do see people sh you know, shouting down others, canceling others, refusing to, to look at the evidence they marshaled because of their identity. And that's destructive. So that was one part of it. You also raised... Um, safe spaces. Oh, safe spaces. It is absolutely the case that some people face much higher risk 
when Sean Bell was killed by police. Most of you are probably, probably way too young. Some of you probably weren't even born. He was shot 50 times on his wedding day in Queens, Jamaica, Queens, black man. Um, when he was killed by police, we went out, the Rev comms went out to the neighborhood that he w was killed in and that he lived in, and we organized people. You were part of that, right? Noche Diaz was a big part of that. Um, to stand up against that. And one of the most striking things at the time was that all these young black women came out. And none of the black men came out. Young black men. And as we talked to them, because a lot, they were furious. They hated this, but as we talked to them, they all had uh, charges hanging over them. So if they got picked up, you know, you get picked up at a protest, maybe if you're a student, it's, it, it's something that's an inconvenience, you wanna fight it, but it's not gonna threaten your whole life, most likely. But these guys, it could be 15 years, it could be life, it was, it, you know, they're facing charges already. So it was much more risky for them to get involved, and ways did need to be found for them to get involved in the revolution and in this struggle that didn't have the same immediate risks for them. And people who don't face those risks so immediately need to step out there and join that fight, which is why it's so destructive to tell white people, stay in your lane, that's not your place. It's why it's so destructive to tell everybody, don't concern yourself with oppression that doesn't affect you directly. We need a movement of people that is stepping up and taking and putting ourselves on the line, not retreating from it. So those unevennesses, those unevennesses are very real and very profound, and we have to have the maturity to traverse them together. But the goal cannot be realized of safe space for anybody in this system. And so while we should take into account those unevennesses and people need to put it on the line and take greater risk where they have more ability to do so, everybody has to put it on the line in one way or the other because this world, there are things bigger than one's safety much bigger than, than any individual safety. And in, you know, in the struggles, Bob Avakian, and I quoted from him, in any real struggle against real oppression, people stand up and they sacrifice. There are many Black Panther Party leaders and fighters who gave their lives. There are many people in the fight in the, for civil rights who gave their lives, and it was right. There were many people who gave their lives in 2020 uprising against the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and it was a righteous thing. It was a, it was a life given that had meaning. We don't want that to happen, but that's because of the system that we live under that carries out this terror and repression. That violence is on them. And if we want that to stop, we can't hide from it. We have to get them off this system, off the face of the earth, and off the backs of humanity. Because every day that they go on, millions and millions of people, 1.9 million people in the prisons have no safe space. The millions of women who are pregnant and desperate right now in Kentucky and Texas and Florida, they don't have a safe space. So we have to step out of our comfort zones. And while we do that, we take into account these differences. But safe space as a goal is bankrupt and it is an illusion because there is no safe space in a nuclear war. There is no safe space in a fascist America. And that's where we're headed. So we have to, we have to lift our sights and we have to become much more daring. So that was a really exciting uh, question and answer, and that's just a little taste of it. We'll show more next week, but you really get a sense of how, you know, this woke framework, which has been paralyzing and suffocating a whole generation of students and artists and intellectuals, you know, especially on college campuses like this, you know, how that framework can get, can get broken, you know, and people can get exposed to a whole different way to understand and change the world and have their sights lifted to, you know, a whole different way to organize society. You were bringing them the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America. So this whole experience, you know, which we saw, you know, in a microcosm at UCLA, it needs to get scaled up in a big way. And, you know, we have big plans to take this tour all over the country and, and really uh, break open this discussion and debate, you know, uh, throughout society. Yeah, we are really fighting for a young generation. Look, you can't make revolution without youth, without students, without young people. And like you said, they are, they're indoctrinated and suffocated by this wokeism or intimidated by those who are. And we are fighting to demolish that and to win people to an actual revolution, to seize this rare time when revolution is more possible. And I think what you saw in that room is a microcosm of what we want to open up in society, which is 
people actually thoughtfully debating, engaging, trying to sort out what is right, what's wrong, and through that process, winning blocks of people to real revolution. So we want to take this much higher, and we want to call on all of you who are watching to get involved in this. And the number one first thing you need to do is to go to revcom.us and read the work from Bob Avakian on woke lunacy. There is nothing like this. If you do not do this, you really have no, you're disarming yourself to understand what this framework is, why it's so damaging, where it came from, and how we can take it on and win people away from it. And then after you do that, and as you're digging into that, we also want to call on you to, to write to us, to volunteer, to work on this effort, to get this speaking tour out, to get this Take down a woke lunacy out in the world, download it from revcom.us, take it out to museums, to theaters, to places where, where you know, events at libraries or other intellectual in events and in, on campuses over the summer, um, and meet people, raise money with it, donate to this, and write to us to get involved so that we can really use this summer to spread this, and then really take the campuses by storm in the fall. That's our plan. All right, we'll be uh, back with more next week. So we're very happy to be able to uh, let you know that we met our mini goal last weekend on our fundraising live stream that we hosted here on this channel as part of our $100 spring early summer fund drive. We made it to the $50,000 mark last weekend. We want to raise more than a hundred bucks. hundred dollars. We want to raise a hundred dollars. Please help us. All right, scratch that. I stand corrected. We need to raise $100,000, much more than $100, but we made it to the $50,000 mark, which is a good beginning. It made a big difference. Um, I just want to say, first off, if you didn't see the live stream, you can go on our channel and you go right across the top there and, it, and there's a uh, little label that says live. Click on that and you'll get to this live stream. It's about two hours and eight minutes or something like that. It really moves along and it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. One of the key points that was brought out very forcefully in, from, the, from the different hosts, but also from the different testimonials is that we're talking about organizing for a real revolution. That's gonna take both a lot of people millions ultimately to make the revolution and tens and hundreds of millions to support the revolution. So when we're raising funds now and people are donating as they're just finding out about the revolution or, or, or have questions about it, you're actually part of a network of people that, will be, that can be counted on in a, in a changing situation and in a change situation when revolution comes on the agenda. So this isn't just about raising uh, funds it's about raising donors and this is why we came up with this plan this is the second point i want to make the plan was in raising yes since our a hundred a hundred thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars and we're close to fifty one thousand dollars now we extended the fund drive not just to get to the goal although that's important but to involve more donors new donors and so we said a, a, a another fund drive another a live stream, yeah, right, in two and a half weeks from now on Sunday, the 25th of June. And we're asking everybody to look at today's show and look at the live stream and from last week and then go out and get 10 or 12 people to watch at your house, to watch it themselves. And if you can get 50 people to watch it in the backyard, put it up on a screen, that'd be great. But you, we need to get a lot of people watching June 25th live stream. Then we're going to have a number of fundraising events around the country on July 4th weekend, as well as some other things. Stay tuned to the RNL show next week to find out about that. And then on July 16th, we got to bring this home and not only raise $100,000, but hopefully get out, go over, over the top on it. So one of the things, it's true, get everybody you know and, and people you don't yet know, go spread this revolution to them. Going and asking for funds is a way of spreading the revolution and raising the funds that we need to fuel everything we do at the show, in this movement, 
and much more that we are aiming to accomplish. And like Andy said, like you said, it's a way to raise donors and people. Um, so don't just get them to tune in in two and a half weeks. Ask them for money now as you are doing this. We want to share uh, one of the many lively portions of the live stream that we did last weekend on the fundraiser, um, an interview that Annie Day did with Chantel, a member of the Revolution Club here in Los Angeles, talking about doing exactly that, just going out to complete strangers in public and raising money for the revolution. There's a tremendous amount to learn from this, so I think we should just roll that. So tell us about this experience you had last February. We were trying to find ways to raise money for the live stream and different amongst different strata people. And we found out very last minute about this international art show on the West Side called Freeze. And it's a who's who of the art world and art collectors come, artists, um, students, um, influencers. So a small team of us actually went out and, you know, put forward, you know, raising money for the revolution. Look, we are aiming to make a real revolution and that's a hundred thousand dollars. That's actually even nothing compared to what's needed. And we are putting that to people very seriously. We found out that tracking it actually helped people see, you know, where their funds, where their funds fit in like this big picture of a hundred thousand dollar goal. And so we're at first we're like, okay, It'd be important if we raised five hundred dollars here and people were chipping in one dollar, uh, five dollars, twenty dollars. As we're approaching five hundred dollars, we are only thirty nine dollars away mm -hmm. and we're announcing that and we're going, OK, like who out there has thirty nine dollars? It's going towards the revolution. It didn't take much. And they like rushed over to scan the QR code and donate the $39. Then we all jumped around and celebrated <laughs> together. And that even was creating a scene people were looking. And I think even off that, someone bought a t-shirt. And so we were still raising money. So we're like, okay, like we're here two more hours. How do we take this further? So we raised the goal to $1,000. And then someone, you know, because we were still there and there was a scene going, came up to look at the table and was someone more serious and, and, and donated actually $400, grabbed the constitution, grabbed um, diff almost everything on the table. Through that process, then we were able to raise at least $900. And uh, yeah, so that was our, that was our exciting yeah. day at Freeze. <laughs> so what kind of discussions were opened up when you, when you stepped to people with the need to contribute funds to this revolution? You know, there was actual thinking then on the prospect of actual revolution and people had to situate themselves and like, oh, I don't know, that's a little that's a little extreme. OK, well, I think this is important. I don't know where I'm at, you know, even explicitly because it was, a, you know, a different strata of people of comfort. And and so but they through that struggle, though, there would still be people who would donate on the contrast, then like the younger people who were giving like five dollars or less and and supporting this from that perspective, we're very excited. Don't be afraid to actually demand the space or or fight for the space that, you know, you actually could have. The first day we were like, okay, we're just gonna stay off in the park area. The next day we actually went on the street and um, just set up like we were supposed to be there. And some people even said, are you supposed, are you part of it? You know, cause that was how official we were. Sometimes we think in our minds that we have to, well, we have to win people over to the political argument mm -hmm. and then ask them to donate. And we kind of tack it on at the end as an afterthought, but you guys had a whole different process. Well, that's what we were doing the first day. <laughs> and we only raised like under $50. There's a reason groups and people do fund drives it's because you need money to do anything and so we went straight up with that and that was a way you know people actually were like oh that's something i can do right now you know and people have money there and even people who didn't have so much money felt the need to do that i think these two points are really important and i think really one just to re-emphasize it mm -hmm. go bold carve out the space by carving out the space mm -hmm. uh and two ask for funds and really stepping with that as a leading edge and letting people find their place in relationship to that. They don't have to be won over to see the difference it will make to contribute financially, to step into this revolution. And then you're opening up a different kind of process where they've already put something on the line. Mm -hmm. And look, we don't have, you know, we, the danger is too great and the possibility for an actual revolution is too urgent um, to, to do otherwise. So Thank you for being here on the live stream today, yes. and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Uh.
Oh, man. Uh, Chantel is something. That was just really <laughs> live wire. She looked fantastic. And, and, the, and how they did that and what they learned through going out those two days, very, very important. You mentioned that we need to, and I also was speaking about continually integrating fundraising into the work of building a movement for an actual revolution. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that there is a way, and a very important way, that you can give continual support to the revolution, sustaining the revolution. One thing is this show, we have a studio that we are sitting in. You, you've you seen that uh, every week. Uh, and we have a crew that works, you know, we, that takes us a week, that works on this show all through the week. Uh, this takes money for rent and for equipment and for uh, high-speed internet and all of this. We need Patreons for the RNL show. Right now we're having to, uh, we don't want to have to rely just on special fund drives to keep this show on the uh, internet. We want that it should be able to be supported by the people who view this by being a patron every week. And there are certain segments and uh, materials that we get, that the patrons get to see either before others and some ca cases that aren't shown more, more broadly. So join that community and sustain the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because if you hadn't, I would have. Please do become a Patreon and spread this show, spread the revolution, ask for money. Tune in next week when we'll be back with the regular show and definitely mark your calendar for June 25th and July 16th for those two punctuating live streams where we're going to make meet our $100,000 fundraising goal and hopefully exceed it. So, Andy? So, uh, in terms of the skill with numbers, <laughs> it is my responsibility. Of Your great for, honor and privilege. Honor and privilege to tell you that when we come back next Thursday night, it will be at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Central time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. But the important thing to remember is the RNL show is the show that you need to watch and bring all your friends to watch it. It's the, all the episodes are online all the time. You can watch it anytime and many times. And so for the full crew of the RNL Revolution, nothing less show, I want to wish you all a good night and we'll see you next week when we're going to be making a special announcement. <laughs>